things from God, like a healing, that they would never get on their own because there's this collective anointing. Everybody gets into the presence of God, gets to worship in God, and, and you have little spikes of faith where people's faith gets built up because they've been sitting under the Word. And that's good. It's not wrong, but long-term, you've got to be able to maintain your faith. You've got to be able to believe God when you're at home and there is no body around to encourage you and there isn't a whole group of people. And this is where most people miss it. They can't maintain their faith over a prolonged period of time. And I believe that patience is nothing but faith, but it is a faith that is stretched out over a prolonged period of time. And it's important that you recognize this because a lot of people define patience as, well, I'm just waiting on God. And what they mean is they've prayed something and now they're just sitting there watching as the stomach turns on the television and they aren't believing God and they aren't in faith. They're just sitting there, you know, twiddling their thumbs and saying, well, I'm waiting on God. You know, there are scriptures that talk about wait on God, like Isaiah chapter 40, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. But that isn't talking about that you're just sitting here saying, God, when are you coming through? I'm waiting on you. This is talking about like a waiter waits on people. A good waiter will be sitting there watching you and waiting until they see that your glass needs to be filled or that you're looking for them and you have a question. That's the way that it's talking about waiting on God. It's not like you're waiting on a bus and you're just waiting on God to show up. No, you are anticipating it means that you are enduring. You are persevering is what the word endure means. Patience isn't a passive thing. It's an active thing where you are actively believing God, but you're doing it over a prolonged period of time. I liken it to running. You know, you can run a sprint where you just give it everything you've got in just 50 yards, or you can run a uh, cross-country race where you are still giving it everything you got, but you've got to pace yourself. You've got to be able to maintain it. You know, when I was in high school, they always had me run the 50 yard dash and the longest race I ran was a 440 quarter of a mile. And it was basically a sprint. And uh, I found out later that some people are geared for sprints and other people are geared for distance and stuff like that. But they didn't teach us any of that in high school. So anyway, I was used to running all these sprints. And then they put me into a uh, cross-country race, 3.2-mile race, 10K race. And they put me in that, and all I'd ever run was a sprint. The, they changed me the day of the race. I didn't practice for it or anything. So we started, and man, boom, the gun goes off, and pew, I took out, and I thought, this is a piece of cake. I was way ahead of everybody. And about a quarter of a mile in, man, I began to start giving out. And everybody started passing me, and I finished dead last. I barely crossed the finish line. You know what? I had lots of energy, but I, I just spent it all at once. This is the way some people are with faith. They just hit these spikes where they come to a conference and listen to the Word and get built up, and they, they believe God momentarily. But I tell you, your Christian life is not going to be dominated by conference to conference. You can use those things and they can be a help to you, but you've got to get to where you can pace yourself. And when you're at home by yourself and nobody's around and all of the kids are yelling at you and all of the demands of life and everything, can you maintain your faith then? That's patience. And it says that it's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises. Let's look over here in Hebrews chapter 6. And there's a lot of really great things here. I'm going to break right into the middle of this. In verse 12, it says that you be not slothful. Again, this is implying effort. Patience isn't passive. Patience is a lot of effort. You have to labor to rest in the Lord and maintain your faith. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then it gives the example of Abraham. And of course, Abraham was called by God 
And I can say definitively that he was 75 years old when he entered into the promised land. I've studied this out and I hadn't got time to share that with you, but I believe it was probably 30 years before he actually entered in to the land of Canaan when God first spoke to him. So it wasn't just the 26 years that he was in the land of Canaan. God spoke to him before that time. I believe it was over 30 years before. So you put all this together, it was like 50, 60 years when God first spoke to Abraham before he saw the manifestation of it. Man, talk about patience. It takes a period of time. How do you maintain your faith for a long period of time? You know, I advertised this tape set yesterday on how to stay full of God. And that's what that tape set is all about. There's people that can have joy and get excited, but they can't seem to maintain it. I have met so many people. I've had so many friends in ministry who at one time were just zealous for God. They were all in. And 20 years, 30 years later, you can't even tell that they ever knew the Lord. They are bitter. They're angry. Their life has gone a different direction. That is not the way that God wants it to be. There are things that will help you to be able to maintain. And anyway, I've got that tape set on it. But patience is one of them. You've got to learn how to pace yourself, how to maintain your enthusiasm, to keep your focus on the Lord. That's what patience is. And so it says it's through faith and patience that you inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Man, again, that's great. You know, I know that there's people that come to a conference like this and you're saying, I'm not leaving until I get what I want. Well, in a way that's good is that you aren't passive. You are aggressively seeking something. You believe that you can do something about it. But sometimes you don't always see a manifestation on your time schedule. And the moment you start putting a date on something and say, I will have this by a certain time, you are setting yourself up for great disappointment if that thing doesn't happen. Scripture says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. I believe that's Proverbs 10, 14 or 15. And man, if you have a goal and don't reach it, it makes your heart sick. And so I personally don't put dates on things. Like, you know, we're starting this second building and I've asked them to tell me how long it took and so it takes. And so they said 14 months. And I said, I've never had a single contractor, not this guy included, ever deliver on time. And I said, I want a realistic esti estimation. So they said, 16 months. And I said, okay, I'm going to say 18 months. That's four months longer than they originally said. And I said, you know what? We're starting in, in July the 15th so that I'll have 24 months before I actually need the thing. So I had to put some dates on that, but you know what? If it took 36 months, I'm not saying that it will, but if it did, I'm not gonna be disappointed. My life isn't standing or falling based on a date. I don't set goals. I don't have a three-year goal and a five-year goal. I have goals. God has shown me things, but they'll come to pass when they come to pass. I think it's dangerous for you to set so many dates and be so locked into it, you could like say, for instance, you're believing to double or something in a certain period of time. What if you only increase 1.75 times? That's still a great, great feat. And yet you wind up being discouraged because you didn't meet your goal. Man, I just have goals of accomplishing things. And when it comes to pass is not really my responsibility. And I've learned that sometimes it just takes a while Never God that's at fault, me, but you know, other people are also involved in what I'm doing. And some people don't think this way. They think, no, it's just between you and God. God doesn't have money. I saw one, that's right. Some of you are, well, yes, he does. No, the Bible says, Deuteronomy 8, 18, God gives you power to get wealth. He doesn't give you wealth. He gives you power to get wealth. He anoints you. He gives you creative ideas. God isn't going to buy your house. God is not going to buy your product. God is not going to send you money. 
I've actually heard a guy one time who sold strings, a green string, and if you put it in your wallet, you'll never be out of money. God will create money and put in there. That's a lie. That's a gimmick. God does not counterfeit United States currency. It's against the law. You are not going to have God rain money out of heaven. God uses people. And did you know what? My finances, God is the one that provides, but he uses people to do it. And there are times that people get fearful. Like I was saying the other night that, uh, you know, when 9-11 happened, the average person quit watching Christian television and went to watching secular news to find out what was happening out of sight, out of mind. And most ministries struggled through that period of time, nearly went out of business because they weren't listening to God. They were listening to all of the reports of the world. And you know what? That affects things. When Jimmy Swaggart and Jim Baker went on trial, Jim Baker went into prison. Did you know what? My income was cut in half. And I didn't have a thing to do with either one of those guys. I wasn't unfaithful. I didn't do anything. But people begin to lose faith in media ministers. If these guys are doing these kind of things, they just became skeptical of everybody. And it affects my finances. So anyway, it's not just a matter of straight me and God. And if I believe God, God's going to supply my needs. God has to use people. And sometimes the supply of God can be hindered by things that go on. Did you know that when the quote unquote great recession happened, uh, Barna did a survey and Barna found out that among those who called themselves born again, this is not just your typical religious person, but those who call themselves born again Christians in the United States, 60 something, nearly 70% of born again Christians coped with the recession by decreasing their giving which is absolutely the wrong thing to do. If, if I could get you to be honest, and if I was to ask you, I'm not wanting you to do this, but if I was to ask you, raise your hand, if you decreased your giving when the quote unquote great recession happened, there's a lot of people sitting right here that that's the way you cope. So there's things like that, that it's not God and God has to use people. It says give and it shall be given unto you. Luke 6, 38, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. Now, God is the one that's inspiring them, but men are the one that give into your bosom. If you are just expecting God to supernaturally meet your need, and if you aren't out there working with some stream of income coming in, if you aren't ministering to people, if you haven't planted seed, if you haven't done things, then you aren't going to receive the supply of God if you don't cooperate. Man, that's some good teaching. I forgot exactly why I got off on that. But that was really good. So anyway, you have to patiently endure to obtain the promise. It says, for men verily swear by the greater an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Again, remember, hope involves your imagination. This is what he was talking about in Romans chapter 8. So we have fled to lay hold of this image, this vision, that the promises of God, that the oath of God has presented to us and in verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and, within, and which entereth into that which was within the veil. What this is talking about, it's talking about the, the temple, the holy of holies, and within the veil is talking about the very presence of God, the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And hope is like an anchor that keeps you from straying from God. Hope anchors you to the very presence of God, that within the veil. And again, this is the very things that I've been talking about. See, patience is the ability to stay with God, not just have little spikes. The religion, it's so common in religion that people have mountaintops and valleys that they've developed entire theologies on this and songs about it. 
And people just believe that you have these mountaintop experiences, but then you go through the valley and it's through the valley where the rain is and that's where all the growth takes place. But Jesus said that he came to bring the mountains down and the valleys up. If in the New Testament, they're supposed to be smooth sailing. Now, if you are having mountaintops and valleys, God is not mad at you or against you, but it's because of your own carnality. It's not because of God. God's not the one who blesses you sometimes and then turns off the spigot and wants you to struggle for a while because that's going to you're going to learn something. No, it's you that turns the spigot on and off. It's because you can't maintain the same level. Again, you need to get that series on how to stay full of God. That fits perfectly with what I'm talking about. And patience is a part of this. You have to get to where you can keep yourself encouraged in the Lord, where you can keep your faith active. And this hope, imagination, is one of those things that anchors you. You know, that's descriptive of a ship. And if you don't anchor a ship, if you just let it sit there, you don't have to turn on the motors. You don't have to put any sails up. You let it sit there and it'll just be carried about with all of the waves and it'll float. And who knows where the thing will go. But if you put an anchor down, that holds it in place. And hope is an anchor of the soul that enters right into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God and keeps you anchored. If your hope isn't strong, then you are going to drift and you're going to be moved off of things. Again, if I'm talking as fast as I can, but you know what? If, you, if I had time to tell you things, God has shown me things. And because I've meditated on it and I have these visions of what God wants me to do, it keeps me on track. It keeps me focused. I don't fluctuate. I don't drift with every wind of doctrine and do things because I've got a purpose. I've got a goal. There are people that wake up in the morning and you don't have anything to live for. It's just, oh man, it's another Monday, blue Monday. We got to go to work and you trudge off to work. And then on Friday, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday because you hate what you're doing and you don't love it. You don't have a goal. It doesn't excite your imagination. It doesn't keep you going. You are in a dangerous, dangerous place if that's the way that you live. You ought to have God's w will revealed to you that has so captured your imagination. You are so focused. You are pressing towards a mark, which is what Paul said. I press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Every person needs to have a goal, a vision, a, an imagination, a hope in front of them of what their life is about that gets you up in the morning and gets you excited about getting up. And it gets you excited about doing something. And if you don't have that, it's a dangerous way to live. You know, Paul was describing this new system of management we, were, we have to our directors. And anyway, he made a statement that I really like. And he says, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. I really like that. And this is the way most people are. They don't have a goal. They don't have something that they're shooting for. And so you know what? They can just take any road, whatever happens, if somebody, you know, just whatever, and you go there and ask God uh, to bless it and hope that it's, it winds up good. Man, that is a dangerous way to live because Satan is going to offer you all kinds of opportunities and things. You need to have a word from God and it dictates what you do. I have people come to me all the time and ask me to do different things and they're good things. I have people that ask me to do things that are good, but not everything that's good is God. Now, that, what I mean by that is I have to stay single on what God has called me to do. If you want to kill a man's vision, give him two. And it'll destroy you. Paul said this one thing I do. You might have lots of things that are good. There may be many opportunities for you and they could all benefit somebody. But is it what God called you to do? You have to have a vision, a goal, a hope that keeps you focused. And it's like I've got these, it's like a football field or something. I've got these sidelines. And you know what? I know the parameters of what God has called me to do. And I stay within those parameters. And there's things that other people are doing that are good and I like it and I support them and I give to other people. Jamie and I just gave a large offering 
to a ministry that takes in abused girls and helps them. And I think it's good and we support it and help it, but that's not what God called me to do. And if I was to start doing that and start diffusing all of my energies, doing all of the good things, but things that aren't what God called me to do, Satan could literally stop me. You got to stay focused. The power of a laser lies in the fact that all of that energy is focused into a pinpoint. If you diffuse it, it loses all of its power. You've got to have a hope that you know what God created you for. What is your focus? You got to be focused on that. Your imagination has to be stayed on it and that will keep you anchored to the right place. It'll keep you from being blown about with every wind of doctrine and it will give you patience. Going back to Romans chapter eight, if you believe, uh, you hope for that which you see not, then do you with patience wait for it. If your hope is strong, if you have a clear imagination, a vision, you see clearly what it is that God wants you to do, patience is just an inevitable byproduct. The stronger your hope gets, it's like it doesn't matter what the devil throws at you. It doesn't matter what obstacles you run into. It doesn't matter. You've got it. You already see it in your heart. And it doesn't matter how many delays or whatever you are going to get there. And a lot of people, see, just don't have their life lined up like this. And that's the reason that, you know, it just seems like the devil can put a little tiny pebble in your way and it just stops your forward moment, movement. Man, you just don't have enough inertia to get over this little tiny thing. But you can get a hope built on the inside of you. It causes patience to come. You build up so much momentum in the spirit. It's like going a thousand miles an hour. I guarantee you a pebble's not going to stop something that's moving at a thousand miles an hour. You could put a brick wall in front of it. And it they might crash, but that brick wall, they will go through it if they're going a thousand miles an hour. But there are some people that just don't have any momentum and it goes back again to your imagination. You don't have a hope. You aren't patient. You are just trying things. And if it doesn't work, and if you run into an obstacle, you just get stopped. You can't seem to overcome it. I'm telling you, I, the way that I'm living, God has birthed things in me for the last 46 years. It is so strong on the inside of me that I just can't even imagine anything that would stop me from doing what God's calling me to do. I could imagine that there are obstacles, that there may be some problems that come, but I'll overcome them. I just don't see that way. And it gives you patience and it gives you endurance, calm endurance. And I tell you, these things, uh, I wish to add time to teach on this. I'm just going to mention this real quickly, but James chapter one talks about uh, tribulation worketh patience. That verse has been misused and people teach that your patience is directly proportional to how much trouble you have in your life, that your hardship makes you patient. That is a total misapplication of that scripture. I don't have time to teach on that, but it's wrong. If tribulation made you patient, then you ought to be patient because <laughs> you've been tribulated. The church ought to be patient. We have been tribulated to the max. Tribulation does not produce patience. Tribulation will simply draw out what you've already got. But uh, Romans 15, 4 says that patience and comfort comes from the scripture. Patience, again, is faith. It's just faith over a prolonged period of time. How does faith come? Uh, Lawson taught that passage this morning, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes through the word of God. Patience is just faith over a prolonged period of time. And it likewise comes through the word of God. You go see other people who had promises from God and like Abraham, at least 26 years, possibly 70 years, 60, 70 years, but he obtained the promises and we take that and it encourages me that praise God, you know what? I hadn't waited near as long as Abraham waited and it just gives me patience. You see other people who just operated in the... 